Hello everyone, thanks for tuning back in. This is Eric, KJ4YZI with Ham Radio Concepts, a video that seems to be a very popular interest in something that we've been talking about the last couple of years in ham radio. You know, I always assume that everybody is an expert that's watching the video, and that's not the case. In fact, more than 60% of my viewership is actually catered to the newcomer to the hobby, not the experts. So a lot of the newcomers see these things that I show, and they're like, what in that world is that? What do you do with this? What's this? What's that? And primarily in this video, what is a hotspot? I've had a lot of people ask. They say, Eric, that's great. I see the open spot or I see the rugged spot you have, but just what does it do? What, what do I need that for? How can I use this if I don't have a repeater in my area? Well, there's a lot of confusion. So in this video, we're going to sum it up. And hopefully with my little bit of non-professional drawings, I can give you an example and a little bit of words to help you understand what a hotspot is. Do you need a hotspot? What a hotspot will do for you and where they originally, how they started and a couple of the models that first came out so we can see how far we've gone on hotspots and what they've done today. In fact, a lot of digital modes now are pretty much run by these hotspots. There's a lot of people that aren't using repeaters. They're using these to talk to the world. So I have a video on the open spot. I have a video on the rugged spot and a lot of other hotspots. You can check those out on my channel if you just found out about it. But if you want to learn more about the hotspots and you're already a subscriber, stay tuned. Let's try to tackle it together. To start, so to answer this whole video in a question, uh, why do I need a hotspot? And we'll go on it further, but let's say you have, you know, in these day and age, you can have a DMR handheld, okay? Or you have a system fusion handheld for, for fusion, or you have a D-Star handheld, or you have an ID5100, or you have one of these digital modes. And nowadays coming out with P25 and NXDN and stuff, Let's say you want to get on DMR and you don't have a DMR repeater in your area. The answer is having a hotspot. And what the hotspot's going to do is take your radio communication from your radio, and this becomes your repeater. So you're transmitting into this, and with the magic of internet and a couple other little bells and whistles, it takes your internet or your uh, transmission, puts it in the internet, and comes out on the other part of the world or another repeater on that mode and also the ability to cross mode. So let's say you want to take your DMR radio and talk to people on system fusion. Okay. So with the magic again of internet and some bells and whistles here and there, you can use your DMR radio through a hotspot to talk to fusion people. Let me break it down first and draw it in the picture so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Back to the amateur drawing board on Microsoft Paint, because we are all amateurs in this hobby, right? So a little brief demonstration, and if you don't understand this, watch the previous video I did first on what is a talk group or what is a reflector. That'll give you a little more idea on how all this stuff works on digital, because there are a lot of people that are still new to this digital, and they have no idea what talk groups or hotspots are. But given that you know that fact, and you're just wondering what a hotspot is, so We'll go back to your basic theory here that an amateur radio operator over here, Craig, K4CPJ, with his uh, D-Star ID51, wants to talk to KM4MCK, John, with his D-Star handheld. But they're 300 miles apart. Now what happens, of course, is when you're talking digital modes these days, Craig is talking with his radio to a local repeater on D-Star. And the local repeater is taking that into a gateway which goes into reflector 30 charlie now that is you know on the previous video a little bit more in depth and on the other side john is also communicating with his local repeater 300 miles from craig and that is also going through a gateway and it's going to destination 30 charlie or wherever they happen to be talking so reflector 30 charlie and the repeaters are bridging the gap from craig to John, 300 miles away, to talk on D-Star. And the same thing can happen on Fusion and DMR and P25. Now, over here, we have Patrick, KI4LUI. And Patrick's all by himself over here. Patrick lives in an area that does not have any repeaters. 
So he may say, well, I would love to talk to these guys and meet these people, but I don't have a repeater in my area. So I guess I can't get on D-Star. And that's absolutely incorrect. Patrick has the opportunity to pick up one of these aforementioned hotspots from various different vendors. And what his hotspot is doing is it's acting like its own repeater. Now, you do have to have internet at some point with a hotspot to work, whether it be your internet at your house. So we'll call this a little router here. And as much as I hate AT&T, we're going to label this Comcast. Okay. And just for the sake of that. Okay. So here's your Comcast router right here. And that's bringing your Wi-Fi in your house. So what's happening is with the setup of the hotspot, Patrick is talking with his radio to his hotspot as if it was a repeater. So it's pretending that you're transmitting to a repeater. I mean, technically you're transmitting right to this box, which may be 10, 50, 100 feet away, uh, but it's right here. Now the hotspot is taking your RF digital signal with your GPS information and whatever else it's sending, and it's turning it into an internet signal. Basically, a bunch of internet packet data with an IP address that's going to go into your Wi-Fi and it's going to come out through the internet wherever you're destinated. In this case, for this video, we're destinating at 30 Charlie. With the magic of that hotspot, Patrick is now able to communicate through his hotspot and his internet into a reflector and join with these two gentlemen here that are talking on local repeaters. So that just bridged the gap between people that don't have a repeater and people that do. Now, in this day and age, a lot of people, like myself, are not really utilizing your home Wi-Fi. They're actually using uh, hotspots on your cell phone. So we'll take uh, find the appropriate picture here. We'll just call this your cell phone. Okay, that's a Galaxy, or we'll call that a iPhone. Okay, so that iPhone now has a built-in Wi-Fi hotspot, which most every cell phone does. And what it's doing is it's taking your data plan from your cell phone service and it's broadcasting it as a Wi-Fi hotspot so that you have Wi-Fi wherever you are, okay? And so your hotspot, you were basically an, in the setup, instead of setting your hotspot to connect to your home router, you get it connected to your SSID and password of your iPhone. If you don't know what a personal hotspot is on a cell phone, you need to research that to understand. So now you have a portable router, let's say, and the same thing is happening. You have your hotspot that is communicating with your cell phone, and your cell phone is turning it into an IP address with a bunch of packets and sending it to Reflector 30 Charlie. So the open spot or the hot spot or the jumbo spot or the rugged spot or the nano spot or the DV mega or any other hot spot is doing the same thing, but just different hardware software in there. So as a brief understanding of what it's actually for, let's talk about the different types because there are a lot and a lot of hotspots out there. You know, these things just didn't come in overnight. They've been around for several years now. And there are a lot more than just these little ones here. You know, they're coming out every few months. There's a different one that comes out. And they all try to have their own unique things about them. They all try to have something better or different than the last. And you may be asking, well, this dealer is selling Zoom spots, and I like this dealer. I order from them all the time, but this dealer is selling open spots. Then there's this guy that's making rugged spots, and this guy that's making micro uh, or nano spots, and this guy, and then China's selling jumbo spots. What are all these? What's the difference? Which one should I buy? What do they look like? So when you just go to Google and type in ham radio hotspot, and click images, you'll probably find the largest collection of pictures of hotspots in the world. Just looking at this, you can see there's a lot of different kinds. Hey, that's from my video. Hey, that's from my video. But anyways, um, all these here are essentially doing the same goal. There's Jason. He's comparing one. He makes videos about hotspots as well. So they're all doing the same thing. They are showing, like I have this one here. It's a rugged spot. But what makes this different than say a jumbo spot for $46 you know well you have to research and find out are they assembled are they a kit 
Do they do multiple modes? Are they for one mode? But they're all doing the same thing. They're bridging us to the internet with our radio to enable us to talk to others that have radios in their hand as well without a repeater in range. Now, I can tell you the very first um, ones of this technology was the DVAP. So the DVAP was a hotspot like this, or they called it a dongle or an access point dongle. And these were really the original staples in ham radio for hotspots. This unit right here would require to plug into a computer. So you would need a full computer running at all times for this to uh, you, enable you to transmit into it on UHF or VHF or however that works. And it would go through your computer through software and uh, enable you to do that. There was even uh, DV dongles, which didn't require, this is the blue one here, the DV dongle that did not even require a radio. And the thing I didn't like about that was this right here, you see the difference between the DVAP and the dongle was the DVAP allowed you to use your radio in your hand. The dongle just, you turned on your computer, you fired up the software, and you talked into your mic and used the keyboard or whatever to transmit. At that point, it wasn't really even radio. It was pretty much like um, like using Skype at that point. You know, you're talking to people that have radios in their hand, but you're using a keyboard for PTT, or you're clicking on a button with your mouse, and talking into your headset or your microphone on your desk. So that was really, these two were the original hotspots to try to bridge the gap for the people that couldn't afford a D-Star radio at the time. However, those things were quite expensive for their day. So when manufacturers started seeing this, they thought, well, hmm, we can make something a little bit different, a little bit better, that still requires a radio in your hand because it's all about radio. So uh, the next biggest one I can think of that was really a uh, huge factor in ham radio was the DV Mega. Now, there may have been variants in between, uh, but the original DV Mega incorporated using a Raspberry Pi, which is a mini computer. It look, looks like this. So it was a board that, or a hat that went on top of the Raspberry Pi. And if you're not familiar with Raspberry Pi, the possibilities of those things are endless. But now you can eliminate having the computer that you needed to plug your DVAP into. And you can use it on a little tiny USB powered computer that had enough processing power to enable you to have your hotspot portable. So instead of you in the vehicle having a uh, laptop open, you could use a little Raspberry Pi. And you pre-program it at the house so that you just plug it in and it's ready. So the DV Mega was quite an accomplishment. I had one. In fact, uh, uh, my video is on YouTube of that. But that's been several years. It's kind of, to my you know, opinion, outdated. So fast forward a couple of years. The next biggest one that I can think of was the original open spot. Now, the Shark RF came out with their open spot. And it was also a self-contained hotspot that had their own coding inside. It was a self-contained, required no computer at all. And it had a transmitter inside that you can set to do various modes. So you can do D-Star, P25, C4FM, because the DVAP really was only for D-Star at the time. And then you had the DV Mega that if you did the modification to the firmware or you soldered a jumper on, you modified the firmware, it would allow you to use other modes. And then you had the open spot that came out of the box with all the modes that were in there. You just had to choose which mode you wanted to use. That was an explosion. We're talking, this was one of the most popular um, hotspots for its time was the open spot. Okay. But the problem with this one was it didn't have Wi-Fi. So then people started coming out with ways to, like you see in this picture here, to tether your Ethernet hotspot to a router that had Wi-Fi on it. So now you had in your vehicle your open spot, and you had your or on your desk, and you had your. Uh, I had a battery-powered TP-Link. Um, I was one of the very first to do that, I believe. A battery-powered router that would tether off my phone and give me an Ethernet output to plug into the open spot. So that people went, around, they did that. They said we're not gonna. We're not going to, you know, throw this away because it doesn't have Wi-Fi. We're going to get this thing working. So the open spot was very successful. So in the middle of all that, I forgot about the DV4 Mini. Now, this is where DMR really came in. This is probably 
you know, if you're looking to shop to buy one of these right now, you have way better options. But you can see here, the DV Mini also required you to plug it into a computer. It was a USB stick with a transmitter inside. Now, keep in mind, all these hotspots are 10 to 20 milliwatts. They are not a lot of power. Enough to get around your house or in a vehicle. Um, this is not for something to set up and try to feed Indian River County as a repeater, okay? So the DV Mini was uh, a, a very popular item at the time, and then people were now combining what I've already told you and using Raspberry Pis as the computer for the DV Mini. Now look at this thing. Look at what you had to have with you. Well, you got your air card for your Wi-Fi, and then your, your your mobile data connection. Then you got your DV Mega plugged in, or your DV Mini plugged into your DV Mega or your Raspberry Pi. You had this whole conglomeration. And I seen, if I could find the picture of the local guy that I had as a friend in the club, he had like three Raspberry Pis, four batteries, and four hotspots strapped together. And this thing looked like the size of a basketball. He's like, I got all the digital modes now. And this thing wouldn't fit in a backpack. But he was trying to figure out how to get them all to do everything. So let's fast forward a little bit more. With the open spot as the um, another you know very important and successful staple, and then we'll talk about when these hotspots started coming out with Pi Star. And really, the Jumbo Spot rings a bell because the Jumbo Spot is one I had. This is a China made um, hotspot, and basically, it was a Pi Zero. So now we're taking the Raspberry Pi and we're making it smaller into the Pi Zero, which you can see little tiny boards, you know. They were very small. A lot of them came kit form, a lot of them came built. But you had the option now of having your little hotspot on a smaller Raspberry Pi, very tiny. Here was looks like a, a picture of the Pi Zero and the hat that went on top, and the prices came way down. And these used a software called PyStar, which was developed, Andy, I believe, MW0MWZ, and he made the PyStar, which was a Raspberry Pi operating system for D-Star and C4FM and System Fusion and, and DMR and P25. So now all these boards, you had at this point, you have China and everybody else taking the Pi Star image, which is online, and putting it on a hotspot. So now it's become that the hotspot hardware is what's different, but the Pi Star software is what's the same across all these Pi Star platforms. Okay, so we're getting to a point now where hotspots are either running Pi Star or they're running their own uh, architecture like OpenSpot. Okay. Then you have other ones like uh, you know IRC DDB and Western Digital. You know a lot of those little ones that people still want to sit on. But the Pi Star seems to be the most popular at this point, and it's compatible with a large array of devices. But you can see here, there's a lot of different types of jumbo spots. Then they had Zoom spots, which were variants that didn't have a screen, or Zoom spots that had the option for a screen. Then you can add the next gen display, like over here, where you can you know, uh, add displays and see what you're doing while you're portable, you know, and people are crafty. I got to tell you, the people that make these hotspots and the people that homebrew and interface hotspots to repeaters and do all that, those guys are smart. They're very smart. I know enough to use the hotspot, program it myself, and get it working. But there's some guys that are really technical junkies, and you guys watching are just, you know, I, I salute you because you guys really know how to program and write code and all that. I don't know how to do all that. I use the device. But see, here's a jumbo spot here. And at this point now, why the person of the clown right here is on this? I have, oh, jumbo spot bow tie. Look at that. This person looks silly. Anyway, <laughs> anyways, uh, so now we look at, you know, because Shark RF had a very successful one and everybody wanted Wi-Fi. And, and again, you, you got to come up with something new in order to keep alive in this business. But these hotspots seem to only last about six months and then they're pretty much outdated. Well, now you have the Open Spot 2, which was a long-awaited product. I did a video on this, and this was all of the best of their Open Spot with ease of setup and, and all different modes. But now with Wi-Fi, look how small it is. It fits right in your pocket. You know, the Open Spot 2 um, was definitely, uh, you can see it's smaller than the size of the radio. I have a video on that as well. And... Um, you know, that's like the newest thing for them. Now, that's going to run for a while. And, the, you know, the prices vary. Well, can you use a, a, a $60 jumbo spot and do the same thing with a open spot two at 200 something dollars? Well, yes, but open spot has their own little twist on there where they have hardware cross mode where you can set the unit to take your DMR signal and turn it around and put it out 
on D star uh, on DMR, a uh, DMR to fusion and fusion to DMR. But then the Pi star has implemented some of that where you can go fusion to D star or fusion to DMR, uh, DMR to P25, you know, different cross modes. Not all of them can be cross moded, but a lot of them can. So you can see that they, they find something that the, the, the users want. They add to it. They modify it. This guy does it. We're going to copy it. We're going to make it better than his. That's what hotspots are doing. But the sole, let's get down to brass tacks. The hotspot is doing the same thing. It is enabling you to get on these digital modes without having a repeater nearby. Okay. And it's up to you to determine why you want this nano spot over the DV4 mini over the open spot. If you looked at it, I could tell you right now. The, the nano spot will be 10 times better than the DV4 Mini because of the fact that it's running Pi Star. It's self-contained with Wi-Fi. It's got a screen on it. I don't need a computer to run it. The DV4 Mini, why would anybody buy that in this day and age? Your comment would be appreciated down below. I've heard people recently on reflectors that are excited to say that they're shopping for a DV4 Mini or they're shopping for this or that. And some of these options are very old. Um, yeah, they may work. But I'm not going to roll around in my truck with a computer running this thing or even a Raspberry Pi with this thing plugged into it when there's other options like rugged spots and open spots and jumbo spots and zoom spots and, and everything else. So, you know, you have to look around. Th this video is very, um, you know, trying to be broad and cover a lot of different points of it. But I, I, I really can't address to you, I mean, a jumbo spot, probably the cheapest right now, open spot two, the newest, um, but in between five or six different options that'll do just fine for you. Uh, so that's your history on really a, 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 a general generic amateur history lesson on where these hotspots came from. But the big question, where are they going? Are these things going to be built in the phones one day? Are they going to build, be built in the radios? Are the hotspots going to have LTE built right on them where you can just pop a SIM card in and you don't need any kind of tethering to your phone for data or any kind of other special computers and need who knows in five years all these that you see on this picture are going to be absolutely obsolete no one's going to want one of these old open spots in five years nobody's going to want a jumbo spot i can't believe what we're going to come to so the answer to the big question eric why do i need a hotspot what should i get a hotspot for well we've already said three or four times in the video that if you don't have a repeater in your area you can get on these digital modes with a hotspot, but there are a couple other instances that I have determined that you may want one or need one. And let's say you do have a repeater in your area, but let's say it's always linked to uh, 007 Charlie. And let's say that the locals don't like when people you know, change the reflector. You want to go to 30 Charlie, which is a busy reflector, but a lot of people don't like that thing being tied up all day. So Rather than tying up the local repeater and having to transmit maybe 20 miles at full power and kill your battery faster, you can have one of these sitting on your desk at very low power, 100 milliwatts on your radio, and transmit into that on whatever reflector you want. It doesn't matter who's tied up or who's using the reflector for a net, or let's say they're working on the repeater and it's constantly up and down. This is your surefire way of always getting on that digital mode, whether it be D-Star or DMR or whatever. Let's say, for me, I travel a lot, and I want to keep in communication with you guys and talk on reflectors and stuff. There may be 15 to 20 repeaters that I pass by in my travels on a day, but half the time, I don't know if those repeaters are linked. I call out. They may not be on the internet. They may not be maintained anymore. They may be locked to a certain reflector I can't link to, or I just may not know they're there. So rather than constantly flipping through that radio on different memories to try to remember where the repeaters are, I link up when you're talking to me on mobile, you're talking to me right now through this. And I go through hotspots like I change underwear because I like to have the newest and greatest thing. But, you know, that's the thing. It, it, it's not dependent on where the repeater is or who's listening because the reality is there are repeaters where people are a little bit funny. They don't want you playing around, changing reflectors. The local repeater, I'm at, they encourage you to change it. Put it on a different reflector. Experiment. Try to meet new people. You know, get it active. Don't let it sit there and be boring. But the, the, the another thing I want to mention, and I'm going to get, you know, I've gotten this before, but I'm going to challenge you to try to challenge my answer to this. 
a lot of people will say, well, you know, your, your hotspots are real, you know, cool. You're, you're, you know, but what happens when everything goes down? What happens when the internet goes down? Okay. Here's my answer to this. Cause I've said this numerous times. Yes. This hobby and ham radio is dependent on, you know, uh, these hotspots are dependent on internet and everything. And when that goes down, these hotspots are not going to work. But for the eight or nine months out of the year, we're not in storm season or the, the, the times that we just want to have fun with this hobby. Are we allowed to have fun? Because a lot of people are gloom and doom. Don't use internet. Don't use hotspots. It's cheating. You keep it on analog only. Forget digital. Don't use all this computerized stuff because what happens when there's an EMP that goes off above your head or the sunspot or the solar cycle blows off an EMP and wipes out everything? You're talking zombie apocalypse style. Can we have a little bit of fun with this hobby and play with devices like this that'll show us and, and keep us in communication when I wake up in the morning and there's no hurricane knocking at my door and there's no atomic nuke from Korea? I just want to have fun with the radio and meet people. Now, again... The people that are saying that half the time don't have an elaborate QRP setup like I have. I got a backpack I can roll out of this house and I can keep communications across the world in the event that zombies come flying through my door. But in the event that's not, I like to just use that backpack and have fun. That's what this hobby is about. If we treat it like it's a disaster relief effort, it's not going to be fun anymore. So keep that in mind that your hotspots with internet and all these digital modes may go down if the internet or the grid or the infrastructure goes down. But the times that you're just waking up on a Sunday and everything's fine, have fun with it. Do stuff with it. Learn about it. Have fun with the hobby. That's my theory. And if you'd like to challenge me, leave the challenge in the below comment and tell me why I'm still wrong that we shouldn't have fun with our hobby. Other than that, I hope you learned a little bit something about hotspots today. The video is a little bit longer than I anticipated, but if you did learn and this cleared it up, first, for the effort of doing everything on a Sunday afternoon for you and leaving my wife outside to fend for herself and giving her no time, leave a thumbs up and also leave a comment below. Subscribe and follow along and hopefully you learn some other stuff about this vast amateur radio hobby. 7-3, I hope to work it on the various reflectors and modes from KJ4YZI.